now on nurses, coping with four bundles of joy, or should that be trouble, relaxing the tie way, and mother love knows no bounds. It's the morning of Sue Cowan's operation. It's invasive and unnecessary to her well-being, but it's something she feels she must go through with. Emotions are running high for her and husband Mike, as she's donating one of her healthy kidneys to her son Dale, who's been suffering from renal failure for a large part of his young life. I'm worried about Dale, and I'm just worried about the operation, just scared. They just hope it worked for Dale. His kidneys aren't working anymore, and he's just so tired all the time. He just can't go out or do anything normal. He's never been able to go out and play, because he's all so tired. He does get sick a lot as well, so yeah, just give him a normal life. Really proud I can do it. I'm glad it was me. You know, 17, he would normally be out clubbing in, in town, out with his friends, girlfriends. None of that's really been possible because he finds everything so difficult to do. So hopefully, God willing, this will change it all. Former senior intensive care nurse Kay Hamilton has led the process of continuous psychological and physical assessment as a coordinator specialising in live transplants. Live kidney donation is where usually a family member who's particularly well and healthy would like to yeah. potentially be considered uh, to give one of their kidneys to somebody who is in need of a kidney transplant. My role yeah. as the live kidney coordinator in particular is to make sure that these couples, both sides, the recipient and the donor, are fully informed and are aware of what stages they're going through of the process. It also involves explaining exactly what all the investigations are about and why they're being done. But really, I see myself in particular as the donor advocate. So I'm there for them and I'm their main point of contact. The ethics of invasive surgery to retrieve a healthy kidney from a live donor are delicate. And as in all cases like this, Sue's state of health is crucial to the transplant's success. The person who is to be the potential donor it has to be tip-top healthy. We have to be very, very sure indeed that we're not going to leave them with any problems after donating a kidney. And so they go through a very rigorous and thorough programme and assessment of their own health, which often takes up to about six months. Dale is on the point of needing dialysis, which would profoundly affect his quality of life. So he's about to undergo what's referred to as a preemptive transplant. His consultant is Chris Dudley. What we mean by a preemptive transplant is a kidney transplant before dialysis is necessary. And there is evidence now to suggest that the outcome is better if you have a kidney transplant before you need dialysis. So Dale is getting a kidney before he needs dialysis and one of the things we have to do is decide when's the right time in doing that. Uh, and we do that by using uh, a plot of what his kidney function is doing over time. Every time we see him, he has a blood test taken. We measure in the blood the substance called creatinine, which is just a marker of kidney function. It's kept at a constant level in the blood. If your kidneys work less well, the level rises. And as the kidneys progressively work less well, the level continues to go up. So that allows us to plan when is the right time to do the transplant. It's a race against the clock. If we don't, if he doesn't have a kidney, you'll have to go on dialysis. That means in and out of hospital three times a week, or if we can do the home dialysis, which is complicated, we live on a narrowboat and it's not easy to do there. Um, so they're trying to make it happen before he needs kidney dialysis. With her parents and sister gone after a day and a half away with husband Stuart, Nicola resumes her daytime routine with her four babies. It was very nice to go away, but we were just too exhausted really to enjoy it. Stuart fell asleep in his pudding, <laughs> literally. <laughs> and, um, and then we did go for a swim, but we were just, by the time we got out, it was just, we were just oh. both of us exhausted. I think I did, had underestimated how much sort of the whole pregnancy and being up all through every night <laughs> has been, and then um, how physically exhausted my body is, really. And it's not just me that's tired, Stuart's tired, and Emily's tired because the baby's in the room next to her, so they're waking her up. So you've, you've sort of in a very tense atmosphere, really. 
The first time I went out without the bag, I fell flat on my face because I didn't have anything to support me and I was just so tired. I went to come to the dental hospital last week and I had quite a stressful drive in. We got stuck behind a tractor, then there was a bridge swing. Then I grounded the car in the car park because we had the roof box on and it, it wasn't high enough. I just got myself to the point where I'm so tired. It'll take quite a while to recover, I think, just to you know, get some decent sleep. And... So in about three years' time, <laughs> yeah, when you start sleeping through the night, uh, it's, it's just exhausting. It's never ending when it's exhausting. In the anaesthetic room, Sue is being supported by husband Mike and senior transplant coordinator Kay, right up until the moment she's put under. It's good that Sue can do what she's doing, but everybody's still scared to death because we've waited a year now. It's, it's a big build-up and then one day hopefully changes all your life. It should be good, but I'm still very, very nervous because I've got two of them which is not normal. Most people have enough, you know, worry with one. I've got them both. As Mike worries about looking after two members of his family needing post-operative care, consultant vascular surgeon Paul Lear reminds himself of his patient's physiology. So we're going to take that kidney, see there. We're just looking at the main draining vein and the main artery coming into it there. I try to keep strong for her, but it's not easy. It's not easy at all. But anybody who says this is easy, it's not. Happy, Steve, for me to make a start. Four steps, please. Over at the Trust's Blackberry Hill Hospital, there's a natural therapy centre where Val Simpson offers highly stressed nursing staff the chance to unwind with some therapeutic Thai massage. Applied yoga with acupressure. Really, that's what they call it, which I learned over in Thailand. I was very stressed out working in Hong Kong as a textile designer and I was there for three years and I couldn't take any more so I went off to Thailand just for a holiday and I stayed in a monastery for a while and then I went for a Thai massage, it was just so good I just thought I've got to go learn this and I did that and loved it and then I thought I'd really like to do this for a job so then I signed up for another course, which is a recognised course over here, so you can get insurance. And that was at the old medical hospital in Chiang Mai. So I did that and got my certificate. And that's what I've been doing ever since. As well as a lot of travelling. <laughs> It's good for opening up the joints, keeping them nice and supple, hips, knees, everything. And it's good for circulation, because it's quite a deep massage, as you can see, I'm going quite deep into the muscles, but slowly, so it doesn't really aggravate the muscles. It's all done very slowly. And it's working on the energy lines, so if there's any blockages, all the thumb pressure that I was just doing, it just helps to free up any energy that might be blocked in there. And then it's also good for calming people, especially people that have got busy, busy jobs and very stressed because the rhythm of the massage works with the nervous system. So it helps to slow the nervous system down so you can't help but relaxing really. And most of the people I see here are nurses. And uh, I do see a lot of kind of social workers actually that work in the hospital and receptionists. So there's quite a mixture of people that come. I've only ever seen one doctor, which is funny. <laughs> Mark has a very stressful job. He's a psychiatric nurse. You're always dealing with people's problems, sort of thing, all day. Sort of uh, trying to get anorexics to eat and uh, challenging behaviour and stuff. And it's, uh, I don't know, it just feels a bit relentless sometimes, you know? so, uh, Coming here, sort of, I uh, only do it once a month, but it's uh, tremendous, really, really nice for that hour. Even when I come down the corridor and I can smell the sort of herbs or whatever it is, it's just stuff, you know what I mean? It's a really, just really nice, you know what I mean? I just sort of associate it with really relaxing. I try get, to get people to go to yoga 
but they come to me instead and have it done on them. I do call it lazy man yoga. <laughs> do you hear that, Mark? <laughs> <laughs> The retrieval of Sue's kidney, which will be transplanted to her son Dale, is going well, but surgeon Paul Lear is beginning to encounter some difficulties. Meanwhile, Kay is briefing some students on the process of renal transplantation. The problem here is there's quite a lot of fat in with the blood vessels, which you'd normally hope to not encounter. They're very wrapped in it at the moment. Serious, actually. Yeah, it doesn't, doesn't make my life easy at all. So when Paul gets to a point, the kidney that is visible, we start getting ready to fuse it. Because obviously the sooner you flush it through with a cold special preservation fluid, the better chance you have of it obviously working out. And all we're doing here is smashing up frozen saline to store it in. As Paul continues to try to remove excess tissue, he encounters a complication. Sue's kidney is fed by two arteries. Normally, there's only one. So this means some unforeseen, intricate work to do. This is a tricky one. This really is tricky. Let's have a oh, last stick. Let's... You all right? No. Do you want some extra not, help, darling? No, I'm not having much fun here at all, I'm afraid. Kidney out. The healthy kidney Sue is donating to her son Dale has been retrieved successfully, and Kay is now flushing it through with preserving fluid. No easy task, as the severed arteries into the kidney are very narrow. Paul, I can't get these perfused. Now that's the main one. Yeah. Okay, well I'll hold the main Hang on, one. Well, there, let me just do it now. Can you stop it for a moment, please. Time for Paul to deploy his exceptional suturing skills, as the two arteries supplying blood to Sue's kidney need to be joined as one before the transplant to her son, Dale. Okay, now. I've got a serious yeah. request, though. Mm -hmm. Can you take my glasses off? Thank you very much, lovely. That's good. Oh, I didn't deserve this today, actually. You I didn't, really did you? didn't deserve this. Okay, Hugh, if you just hang it there, there, that'd be good. Thanks. I just, it's just got to be held very steady. This. With some precision surgery, the kidney is finally ready for transplantation. Going that's going down that one, and that's going down that one. Uh, so there's the two arteries sewn together to make one bigger opening for enable it easier to transplant. And there's the renal vein, and here's the ureter. It's a lovely sunny day and twin baby girls Abigail and Jessica have come with mum Nikki to watch their dad playing cricket. Although the sunshine is a blessing for most, Jessica won't be able to enjoy it after the recent advice given by the doctor at the laser clinic. <laughs> they said that her skin's quite tanned at the moment, so we've, we've got to be very careful to keep her out of the sun, hence why she's got a hat on today and we've put sun cream on her, because we're quite keen that she starts her treatment in September and doesn't have to wait any longer, so we'll do everything that we can to keep her out of the sun. We obviously take each day as it comes, so we're not going to worry too much about what may or may not happen. Um, it's always been um, something that we've never worried about in the past. So it is a worry to think that we might have to constantly be going for further treatments up to whatever age it may be, but um, so far so good. Obviously, we're going to be very, very concerned when it starts. We just are staying very, very positive um, in that the treatment will be very successful. And that's why we're so keen for it to start. And we're excited about it. Former nurse Rachel Hillen is now a midwife. She worked long and hard to be appointed to a specialist post giving advice to anti- and postnatal mums on breastfeeding. As with many healthcare professionals, she met the person she wanted to share her life with through work. She first met Pete when she was a student nurse. He was a psychiatric nurse. He did his training down in Kevin Coyd in Swansea. And then he went on to do a post reg course and he came up to Bedford to do that where I was doing my nurse training. And um, it was actually where my mum met my dad as well, so, no, you know, it's just quite funny that that should happen again. I met Rachel when I was doing my, um, my, my postgraduate general nursing um, in Bedford, 
So I'd already done my psychiatry uh, and I was doing the, the shortened course, the 18 month course uh, in Bedford and that's where we met. <laughs> well, I knew all about him before I met him. It's just one of those, you know, a male nurse, everyone wants to know, oh, have you seen the latest men in the next group? And one of my friends, one of my good friends, was actually working with Pete and she just used to go on and on about this Welsh Pete. So I thought, I'm going to have to see this Welsh Pete. But she was a cheap date, actually. Um, she, she's never drunk that much. Uh, it was probably Strong Bay. And he told me it was Welsh champagne. And I believed him. <laughs> so on, on two things, she could get tipsy quite easily, which was great. I think he only went out with me because I had a car. Not many of the nurses had cars. <laughs> and she had a car, actually. That, that was, a, that was a, a definite advantage. Yeah. Well, actually, I couldn't really understand a lot of what he was saying. In, in, People look at midwives. Um, I think if you if you if you put any of the any of the health, we got Alan Milburn and his babies coming out, and the midwife said, "How much am I worth now?" Um, I think you know. I, I think it'd be worth an awful lot. You, you can guess the answer. So I just used to yeah, and hoped I said it in the right place. <laughs> but joking apart, Pete's very supportive of what Rachel does. She's very dedicated, and I, I admire anybody who's uh, who's committed to to the work they do. After fixing the complication of splicing Sue's two arteries into one, Paul is ready to insert her kidney into son Dale. There's no need to remove Dale's failing kidneys. The system will simply be bypassed and his mum's kidney will be located in a space just above the groin. Now, there we go. OK, thank you. Just got that dropped down. And I'll try and pull that one up at the same time. It's like num this is a, it's Painted honestly by it's by, it is surgery by numbers <laughs> in the most extreme sense. The transplant turns out to be a good deal easier than the retrieval. The kidney must be connected to the body's bloodstream. Success is clearly shown when the donor organ suffuses with blood and turns to a healthy pink colour. There we go, kidney now suffused with blood. Luckily the whole thing's pink, that's the important issue. Means I got my little join up on the bench right. I think it's all gone very well actually. It wasn't quite as surgeon expected with retrieving the kidney because we discovered that there was two arteries when we didn't expect those. But in fact the transplant's gone exceptionally well. The donor's already awake. She feels very comfortable out there. And um, Dale, the recipient of the kidney, is just about to go around to recovery now. Mother and son are doing well in recovery, and Kay checks on their progress. But is it, is it, everything's gone fine, oh isn't it? Far more easy than you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You always have to prove a little tricky. Midwife Rachel's husband, Pete Hillen, is living with a long-term problem. As a young amateur football player, he injured the cruciate ligaments in his knee long before a surgical cure was developed. So he has had to live with ongoing discomfort and pain, and it's been getting worse. I'm in pain every day, to varying degrees, uh, and even at night. Uh, if, if I'm lying in a, an awkward position for any time, then I wake up with the pain. So um, it can be quite, quite wearing. It's actually very restrictive in what I can do with, um, with my children. Over the last few years, his leg has been quite painful just little things he wants to do with the boys. You know, he'll do it because he really wants to. And then after a while, he'll just sit down, he'll be rubbing his knee and he'll say, well, not, you know, in a minute, boys, I'll just let me have a little rest. I was quite a successful footballer as a schoolboy and I played for um, Welsh schoolboys, potentially going to sign for Leeds United. So, uh, so I keep telling everybody anyway. I'm a professional piggy in the, piggy in the middle. Come on, Mr Footballer, come on. I'm not saying I would have made it, but I'd love to have had a go. Um, looking back, yeah, it, it's it's a big regret of mine, but you know, I've been very lucky in other ways. Whoa. The inside of my knee is actually worn down significantly. So effectively it's bone on bone. So every time I walk, every time I drive, it's bone on bone and it's wearing down. So I'm actually having the cruciate ligament repaired and I'm having half a new knee as well. So it's a combination of the both. And I think, I think it's, a fairly rare event to have them both done in one go. I am very nervous about it, but I can overcome that for the reasons of, of having it done and having, um, hopefully, 
in certain ways a new lease of life. That sounds rather grand, but, but, but to me it means an awful lot. Although the delivery of Nicola's four babies, Harry, Matthew, Ben and Anna, was a great success against many odds, there is a downside. Financially, it's a nightmare. They get through a packet of milk in two days, so it's about 3.50 a day in milk. We're getting through 24 nappies a day. Clothes, I mean, we've been very, very lucky. Lots of people have given us clothes, and um, we're trying to sell the house. That's the, the next thing, because also I won't be able to return to work, because I don't actually, I'm not... I'm not a skilled person and I don't earn enough to pay for childcare for four babies. And um, after tax, it, you know, it just wouldn't be worth me going back. So the house is on the market and we'll be trying to find somewhere cheaper, more affordable. And we can have a, we can enjoy our children, not have to worry about money, which is what, you know, what we want to do. Where you would sort of maybe treat yourself or you'd, you'd go out and you'd buy socks or baby grows for, for them. You could call times by four, and it's you know, you're looking really time you've kitted them out, you can it's going to be the best part of 100 pounds. I'd like to think that we'll sell the house, we'll buy somewhere that we can stay in, that we can if it's smaller now, that we can it's got enough extendable room so that um, we don't have to move again, really, and that we've, we've got enough sort of free income so we can enjoy the children, we can have holidays. And now we've got them, we want to enjoy them. And yeah, I think that's a priority. Next on Nurses. Do I sound as Terry Fagel No, you sound great. But as he grew, his lungs weren't growing, and that's why that's why he died. That's a normal, healthy reaction in that leg. With that, we have nothing at all. What would you have done differently then, do you think, if you had the time again? Or... I'd have had it at home. You would have had it at home, yeah, yeah. but you were induced. Oh, true. So you couldn't? Not about that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to pull it up. And inside the knee, I watch it being um, pulled up inside the knee. People say to me that I'm very brave. But I say it's not particularly bravery. It is desperation to have another child for me and for my family. We've had stories of people who've been ballroom dancing and the tendon's gone and they've turned around and swiped the partner next door thinking that they've, they've kicked them while they were dancing. That's gone in with a nice snug pop. Click on screen for more videos of extraordinary humans.